Adair County, the place we love and call home has many wonderful attributes as a community. However, just like many other communities in the United States, we have a substance use and mental health problem. These problems, while they may be common, can contribute to a variety of premature deaths, including death by suicide. This documentary provides a closer look into suicide in Dare County. We will introduce you to a diverse group of Dare County residents who have been affected by suicide. The diversity represented in this documentary is proof that suicide knows no bounds. We hope this documentary will raise awareness and inspire prevention among those who watch. Sometimes seeing someone so happy or inactive and lifestyles that look just seem amazing and then they go and kill themselves and like what happened they were you know financially stable had a house wife and kids great career what triggered this what was missing or hiding and sometimes you can't find anything and that's the worst thing is is when someone takes their life that they're not rationally thinking that they may be at a low spot at that moment but the next day could be better there's all kinds of paths to suicidal ideation. Addiction, depression, anxiety, disease. I'm nearing death anyway. But I guess the thing that came to me, the common denominator of it all, is the world will be better without me. And I think that's the one that crosses the borders. And that's what we have to get to people and, and, and convince them that, no, that's not the case. Mental health is a problem that touches everyone. It crosses all boundaries and all walks of life. Mental health problems are common as nearly one in five U.S. adults live with a mental illness. Dare County is no exception. Mental health and substance use have been concerned since the first community health assessment took place in the early 2000s. We have made more progress in talking more openly about mental health in general. However, suicide and suicidal ideation still remain highly stigmatized. Just look at the language we use when talking about someone who died by suicide. The phrase committed suicide is most commonly used. When you stop to think about the use of the word committed, what else do we use the word committed with? We say that someone committed a crime or that they committed a sin. In essence, the phrase is placing blame on the individual that died. When someone dies of cancer or in a car accident, we don't use language to describe their death in a way that places blame. So why do we do this with suicide? My dad was a wonderful, hilarious, kind man. He made everybody laugh. He made everybody feel welcomed. No matter if he knew you or not, he could just pick up a conversation with you, make you feel like you've known him for years, even if you haven't. He was great. He was truly, like the best dad I could have ever had. He was really sick with Lyme's disease and it was very debilitating for him. It, it was years of just him being so sick and so sad and there's no cure for Lyme's disease. So he knew he wasn't gonna get better despite all of his attempts to get better and had mental health issues. Um, and when he started to get worse with the Lyme's disease, he started talking to me more about how bad he was feeling and the things that he did think about and how he was worried that he may end up committing suicide at some point. And it was actually earlier that year in April that he said that and then September is when he did it. The emotions and the feelings that you go through, especially with suicide, it's a lot. It's angry or sad or both at the same time. Um, I went through both of those emotions um, and it took some time for me to understand that just because he did what he did doesn't mean he didn't love us at all because he loved us so much and he loved so many people and so many people loved him and he knew that. 
Research has shown that asking someone if they are having thoughts of killing themselves is actually more likely to save a life. And ultimately, when we don't talk about something, we don't learn. I'm here to tell you, suicide is a problem in Dare County. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. However, it is the 8th leading cause of death in Dare County. And while we saw a 3.14% decrease in our suicide death rate in our last community health needs assessment, we still have a much higher death rate when compared to North Carolina. The important question is not why a person wants to die, but why they want to live. Having unfinished business in life gives purpose and goals. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Michael Hout is my deceased husband and he, he lost his life to suicide. Michael was a very funny person, just an all around great guy. Someone that you would actually want to sit down and, um, and, and have a conversation with. He had to have a unexpected triple bypass surgery. People don't realize, or the public doesn't realize, when you are told that you are, have to have a triple bypass surgery, you don't hear the part that depression can set in within your first year of having triple bypass surgery. His pride was hurting him a little bit because of not being able to do the construction work that he used to be able to do. The day that he decided it was over, sorry, um, we touched base all that day on the phone. He was with our dog. <laughs> so um, I just felt like that he was at a bad spot with them being depressed that day. So I talked to him all day long. I went home, I pulled up, and when I got out of my car, the whole subdivision seemed like it was dead silence. Nothing was moving. Our dog sitting on the porch outside. It's like, that's unusual. He's not outside by himself. So I walked to the barn and and normally when either one of us is in the barn, the, the barn door is never closed. So um, I go to the barn and I'm like trying to get in. I can't get in. There's something blocking the door. And I push harder on the door so I can make room for me to get through. I see him laying there and at that time I see my own footprints. Blood. I stepped in blood. He took his life. That he was depressed so heavy and, and walking in the dark so heavy that he felt like there was no other choice. The hardest part of that night was having to pick my phone up and call his two boys to tell them that the father was gone and how that he left this world. People that are left behind, number one, I mean, you know, what I was feeling was confused that day. I was confused. I really didn't believe that it was happening to me. It happens to everybody else's family. It happens to everybody else's you know, spouse. It doesn't happen to me. And that day, it happened to me. The past few years have taken a toll on the mental health of children, adolescents, and adults. Be Resilient OBX chose to collaborate in bringing awareness to suicide in Dare County because it is important to talk about and help our community overcome the stigma associated with mental health and suicide. If we can help people regulate their nervous system and learn tools to cope with adversity and trauma, we can build a more resilient community. You are not alone in your journey. So in uh, 1990, as a young, I'd, I'd been on the street for three years. I was still brand new, still utopian in thought, trying to help the world. Um, and I was involved in the, still today, one of the most controversial officer-involved shootings that the department's ever, ever been through. I always thought the post-traumatic stress was kind of an acute ordeal where you had the nightmares and stuff, which I did. But I didn't realize it could turn into a chronic condition. And at some point, I didn't know where the alcohol took over and turned into alcoholism and where the 
post-traumatic stress left off. But that was the genesis of my addiction and my suicidal ideation. I kept it in the closet very well, my addiction and my suicidal ideation, until I couldn't keep it in the closet anymore. And it started to surface. Um, and I started kind of melting down. As the deputy chief, there were nights when I was um, too drunk to go in to respond to calls when officers were involved in shootings or officers were severely injured. And it, it began this really shameful process where I just started beating myself up internally. And like I said, eventually I couldn't take it anymore. Um, and I, I knew I needed help and I landed in rehab. Came back from it, uh, felt great, clear-headed, and things started taking a turn for the worst. My child's mother at the time was dying of cancer, and everything turned for the worse. And I couldn't process trying to recover. I couldn't process trying to handle raising my son on my own. And I crashed and burned. That's when I, uh, my daughter, I took her, I met her at, at Starbucks in Indianapolis. She didn't know at the time, but I was saying goodbye to her. I was gonna drive home from that, um, buy, a, buy a handle of vodka, get peacefully drunk and blow my brains out. My ex-wife at the time helped me through it. I mean, I, I went through trauma therapists uh, both times at the ranch in, in Tennessee, um, but I was able to get back, um, get into talking to some counselors at the time um, and talk through it. Um, it wasn't easy, but eventually I got through it and uh, saw light at the end of the of my dark night tunnel. According to Dr. David Jobes, creator of CAMS, Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality, there are primary drivers such as inability to solve problems, intense emotional dysregulation, and lack of reasons for living, loneliness, disconnection, shame, no sense of belonging. There are secondary drivers such as financial problems, ruptures and attachment bonds, illness, pain, lack of belonging, and interpersonal conflicts. This loss leads to a sense of isolation reinforced by hopelessness and fear this is permanent. Sometimes there are no symptoms or signs. And sometimes signs and symptoms are so subtle that family members don't recognize it until after the fact. It is natural to feel guilty after a loved one dies by suicide, but it's important to remember it's not your fault. You can watch for warning signs, including talking about being a burden, being isolated, increased anxiety, talking about feeling trapped or an unbearable pain, increased substance use, looking for a way to access lethal means, increased anger or rage, extreme mood swings, expressing hopelessness, sleeping too little or too much, talking or posting about wanting to die, and making plans for suicide. You know, my mother would not tell anybody that my dad suffered from alcoholism. So there were a lot of people that still, even when, when he died, had no idea what his cause of death was. He was taking um, Valium and Librium and it led to his demise. I think it made me more tolerant of substance use and mental illness. I think I look at the good in a person. I look at the person for the person and not their illness, be it substance abuse or mental health issues. There are risk factors that can make a person more susceptible to die by suicide. Individual risk factors that can contribute are previous suicide attempt, history of depression and other mental illness, serious illness such as chronic pain, criminal or legal problems, job or financial problems or loss, impulsive or aggressive tendencies, substance misuse, current or prior history of adverse childhood experiences, sense of hopelessness and violence, victimization and or perpetration. Harmful and hurtful experiences within relationships can also contribute to risk, and those include bullying, family or loved one's history of suicide, loss of relationships, 
high conflict or violent relationships, and social isolation. There are also community issues and challenges that contribute to risk, and those are lack of access to health care, suicide cluster in the community, stress of acculturation, community violence, historical trauma, and discrimination. Well, you know, those life circumstances that I talk about that kind of led up to the thoughts were, um, I lost my grandfather who was hugely influential in my life. So I was dealing with grief. I had been through a divorce after a decade of marriage. And so I was dealing with loss, trying to navigate how to be a co-parent after being used to having a secondary parent there all the time with me you know, all of it together over about a two year period. And so grief, loss, job change, salary change, status change, all of that together kind of put me in the position where my anxiety was in overdrive. And then I started getting hugely depressed because I couldn't manage it anymore. And that's when those thoughts started and I had always been a person that said, you know, if anybody ever finds me dead, investigate it because I would never kill myself. I had always said that until life circumstances put me in a position where I probably had an underlying mental health issue all along that just never got treated. And the thoughts start small, like, oh, I'd love to go to bed tonight and just close my eyes and not wake up. They start very, what someone might consider minor, but then it's more and more and more and more until all you think about is um, doing it. I think the reason that I decided that day was opportunity. I had quiet time, really intrusive thoughts that wouldn't leave me alone, knowing that my daughter was out of the house was a big influence on when I decided to do it and had made up my mind that hanging would be the best way. My husband heard me and came in. He got me down and was able to get me to kind of come back around. The first thing that I said to him when I started getting my wits back about me was it didn't work. I convinced him to not call anybody, to not tell anybody. He held me that evening, and Monday morning I got up and went to work, as if nothing had even happened. And that's why I say that there's no greater actor or actress out there than the person that wants to die and has to keep on living. When I went to work that Monday, my husband called two of my best friends, and when I got home from work, I went straight to bed, and my husband came in and knocked on the door and said, you have a, you have a couple of visitors. And I said, honestly, I'm just so exhausted, I cannot stand to have visitors right now. And the more, more boisterous one of my friends said, well, too bad, we're here and we're coming in. And so they, um, convinced me that the right thing that I needed to do was to go to inpatient treatment. And so I did. I went to inpatient treatment voluntarily um, and stayed for um, four days and got started on some medicine. I had never been on medicine before, but there was some chemical imbalance related to mine and got the counseling that I needed and went to group therapy and heard other people that were professional people say, you know, I have this same problem. And it was like it dawned on me all of a sudden that I'm not the only one in the universe that's dealing with this. So um, I say they saved me because <laughs> they got me where I needed to be. We want people to understand how to prevent suicide. Just like there are circumstances that make individuals more at risk to die by suicide, there are personal protective factors which can limit risk, which include effective coping and problem-solving skills, reasons for living, 
for example, family, friends, pets, etc., and a strong sense of cultural identity. Healthy relationship experiences can also protect against suicide risk. Examples of those are support from partners, friends, and family, and feeling connected to others. Community experiences that can protect against suicide risk are feeling connected to school, community, and other social institutions, and availability of consistent and high-quality physical behavioral health care. My dad was very funny. He was a surfer. He was a lead singer and guitarist in many bands, but quite a few that could have been very successful. Um, he was a father of two. He was a, a pretty good husband. Since I was alive, my dad was a very, very up and down person. Um, when he was high, he was super high. When he was low, he was very low. So it was probably, I believe it was around six o'clock in the morning, I had received a Facebook phone call from his boss saying, have you seen or heard from your father? We're worried, he's supposed to be at work. He would start his shift at six. She was at the house trying to get in. All the doors were locked. The roommate said that his door was locked and I didn't know what else to do and I gave them permission to bang the door down, which is when they found my father. We looked through his phone. He had left us two videos and uh, that was kind of hard to watch. It seemed very, very paranoid and scared. So I think he was terrified. He apologized several times to everyone, to God, to us, the grandbabies, and that he just felt extremely lost and didn't want to burden us with it. Perfect! Yay! That's perfect! So good! Look! And I just miss him so much. And I think about him all the time. There are simple steps you can take to help someone who is in emotional pain that may save a life. Ask, are you thinking about killing yourself? It's not an easy question, but studies show that asking an at-risk individual if they are suicidal does not increase suicidal thoughts. If they express thoughts of suicide, do everything you can to keep them safe. Reducing a suicidal person's access to highly lethal items or places is an important part of suicide prevention. While this is not always easy, asking if the at-risk person has a plan and removing or disabling the lethal means can make a difference. Please be there for them. Listen carefully and learn what the individual is thinking and feeling. Research suggests that acknowledging and talking about suicide may reduce rather than increase suicidal thoughts. Connect them to help. Save the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline number in your phone so you will have the numbers if you need them. This mental illness and suicidality does not have a pick or choose methodology. It can touch anybody, anywhere, anytime. Mental health is something that can be difficult to recognize because we don't always take care of ourselves, but it truly is an illness like any other chronic illness. And once you realize that there's an issue, get the help then. Don't sweep it under a rug. If you're feeling chronic fatigue, if you're feeling like there's no way out, if you're feeling helpless, if you're feeling hopeless, don't let yourself get low enough to get to the point of suicidality. But get the help that you need early. Don't wait until it's too late. And that's hard for people to say, I have a problem. It's hard for people to say because we've, we've made mental illness out to be somebody's crazy. We haven't made it out to be a true illness that a person may not be able to battle with on their own. But still, after you get 18 years old, it's up to you to reach out. And but how do you get someone to reach out that's in the dark and, and, and thinking about their lives? We have all these commercials and these, you know, the outreach with the telephone calls. But how do we get that person to take the step to make that call? 
So it's not that our community doesn't have the support for it. It's having the person to reach out to say, hey, I need help. I'm thinking about harming myself. There's always someone out here that will listen. There's always someone out here that will grab your hand and say, I got you. That you don't have to be in the dark. The hope would be that there, there is light at the end of the tunnel and there are resources available and there are people like me, lots of people like me running around that, that are peer support people that know what you're going through because we've been there. And all it takes is to pick up the phone or, or start looking for those resources. And people like me are willing to talk. I mean, I'll go anywhere to, to help somebody that's struggling through the darkness of addiction and suicidal ideation. There's always hope. As long as you're breathing, there is hope. We've got to shatter the stigma. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my wife. I'm going to, I'm going to lose. So I'll just stay back here in my little depression, alcoholic, drug addicted state because I'm scared to reach out because of the stigma. Please keep in mind that you should always call 911 in case of an emergency. You can also reach out to 988, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, which offers 24 seven call, text, and chat access to trained crisis counselors. These individuals can help people experiencing suicidal, substance use, and or mental health crisis, or any other kind of emotional distress. Integrated Family Services has a mobile crisis team which offers 24-7 assistance for people in crisis. They can be reached at 1-866-437-1821. There are a variety of mental health professionals in Dare County. You can visit BreakTheStigmaOBX.com or SavingLivesOBX.com for names and contact information of local mental health providers as well as other resources. Thank you.